Hey everybody, it's Matt with the DPI Show. Welcome if this is your first time. Welcome back if you are an avid watcher of the show. Today is November the 24th. We are on Thanksgiving week here in the United States. Um, This was my kid's last day of in-person school. Um, And this is the Disney News and Notes show that we put on weekly. Uh, Lots going on. We got the announcement of Park Hopper um, in the last week. Some more announcements on what is going on at Epcot and uh, a cool announcement about the high speed rail that Florida is putting in. So stick with us. I'm going to bring Peter on. Um, We did a segment earlier today that we recorded so um, you can get our conversation back and forth on it. But real quick, let's talk about our social media accounts. So the best place to check us out is definitely on Facebook. That is where I post the most, um, at DPI Podcast. If we are over on Twitter, at Disney Insights, I do do a lot of back and forth with the Diz Twitter family over there. Um, but past that, we do a lot across the board. Uh, Facebook and uh, in our Facebook and Twitter, definitely the most, but we do a lot on YouTube. We're starting to bring up the Instagram account a little bit more. So, uh, we do have a presence across the major platforms. So let's go ahead and jump into that conversation I had earlier today with Peter. Hey Peter, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. So much stuff has happened since last week though. Yeah, there's a lot going on at the park. So I, I want to lead off with the big thing and talk about park hopping at the park. So this is going to be a huge change um, from everything else that's been happening post-COVID. So kind of give us a little bit of insight on how it's going to happen. So it looks like um, they haven't released the official date. All I've seen is 2021. So I'm wondering if it's going to be, I don't know if it'll be January 1st or maybe like the week after that. They might change their mind just because, you know, as you and I both know, New Year's Day and a couple days after New Year's are are very, very busy. But um, ultimately, the way it's going to work is you're still required to have a park, uh, like a park reservation to get into your first park of the day. And then once you have that park reservation, and you go in, you can now purchase park hoppers. And the way that that's going to work is with your park hopper, um, you're going to have your park reservation. You're going to go to park reservation. You can get there as early as the park opens. And then at, they said after 2 PM, you'll be able to park hop. So right around that 2 PM time, um, you'll be able to park hop. Now, I think that there's still some details looking to come out. So for example, Epcot, right? Epcot has park hours right now, essentially 11 to seven is what Epcot's doing right now. Whereas Magic Kingdom is nine to six. So, or nine to five, even some days, a lot of times nine to six. Um, So if I can park up at two, can I park up to Epcot at two? Or can I park up to Magic Kingdom at two? Um, You know, park up into somewhere like Animal Kingdom closing at five. Is that really worth a park up? It's all, there's, there's a lot kind of out there. But ultimately what we do know right now is that Coming back in early 2021, you you can purchase park hoppers, you can use park hoppers. If you ask me my opinion on it, I just don't know with the limited park hours if park hoppers are necessary or worth the money, honestly. Yeah, I think we, we talked about that a little bit with our trip that's coming up. And, and we actually looked at the value of park hopping versus the value of adding another day um, to hit the fourth park. And we determined that, you know, we, we thought it would be more valuable to add that fourth day. And, you know, I, I kind of echo your thoughts on there's a little bit unknown on when a park is actually going to be available to start park hopping at because they're at staggered start times right now, um, for really transportation reasons more than anything, so that you don't have a ton of people in those bus queue lines all at the same time, um, you're going to see a lot of people that, you know, early stages are probably going to try and do that Animal Kingdom to Epcot park hop, especially if Epcot is open for park hopping at two o'clock which I don't think it will, but who knows what's going to happen with this because there's so few details right now. 
So if it is something that you're looking forward to coming in 2021, definitely watch what happens early on as they release it and see what makes sense. Because is it going to be as they see people leaving? Are they going to start estimating it at the beginning of the day? We don't know anything about when they are going to release the times and when you're going to be able to say, hey, this is what I want to do. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Because, you know, all of that is dependent on a park having capacity, right? So how many days have you and I looked at the availability screen and all three tiers? So that would be pass holders, resort guests, and standard ticket holders. How many times is Hollywood Studios out of reservations, right? So yeah. even though Hollywood Studios is open till seven or eight o'clock most days, that seems like a prime candidate to park hop to, especially if I can get, you know, Animal Kingdom nine to two. Yeah, for sure. That's feeling like a full day at Animal Kingdom if you do it right. And then two to eight over at Hollywood Studios. Sure. That sounds awesome. Same thing. Two to eight over at Epcot. Great idea. But am I going to be able to park hop to Hollywood Studios? It's all going to be dependent on availability. Now, the second park, they, they've said that you don't need a reservation for your second park, but there's got to be some type of a transfer system in my mind, right? You all have the tickets or the magic bands. Or yeah. Whatever. So I feel like there's got to be a, hey, I'm leaving, but I have to check with an iPad at the exit and say, I'd like to transfer to Epcot and then go do, do, do. Got it. You're transferred to Epcot. Enjoy the monorail ride. If anything, what I'm excited for is the fact that park-to-park -park transportation is going to be back up and running. Yeah. Including that Epcot monorail loop. So it does give people the ability to say, park at Epcot, go to Epcot, leave and come up to something like Grand Floridian or Contemporary for lunch, come back down to Epcot or whatever else. That did run into me a couple of times on our trip where I wanted to say, um, I think one time I wanted to leave Hollywood Studios and I had a, a reservation like on the monorail loop. I, I can't remember the specific situation, but I tried to go from park to park, not for the intent to go into a second park, but for the intent of like getting nearby for dining or whatever. Oh, that's what it was. I wanted to go from Magic Kingdom to Hollywood Studios so I could then ride the Skyliner away back to my resort, right? And, uh. and I couldn't do that, right? So I had to ride the bus. And so I had to wait in the line for my resort. I was just trying to like sneak around resort bus line. And I ended up having to wait in line for it because you, there was no park to park transportation. So if anything, at least that'll come back in the mid to late day. Yeah, and I, again, I'm with you on, there has to be some kind of tally system that lets Disney know how many people are wanting to go to Hollywood Studios, wanting to go to Epcot as that park hop. I would almost expect it to be like the virtual queue for Rise of the Resistance. You know, you go on your My Disney Experience app, you say you're going to park hop from, you know, Hollywood Studios to Epcot that day, you put your thing in, and then they let you know if you're able to do that park hop. Um, there's got to be some kind of electronic tally system because if there's not, you're going to see a lot of people waiting outside, especially a Hollywood Studios, because it's going to hit capacity because it's already at capacity. You're probably not going to have a ton of people leaving, especially if they're waiting for a Rise of the Resistance boarding group. So mm -hmm. you got a lot going on with Hollywood Studios. So that's going to be interesting to see how that, you know, kind of works itself out. Again, Definitely watch how it's working at the beginning of the year. From my understanding, I've heard that it's January 1st. So they've had the park hopper tickets available for January 1st. I imagine it's January 1st. They're just going to let it go, even though the parks are going to be at capacity, basically. I think you're going to see that um, as 2021 rolls in. Now, the other thing that you want to talk about, and especially with you with us today, is implications for travel because this is just another thing that Disney's bringing back now and we can't be too far away from them starting to announce hey we think that we're going to start putting up fireworks but we've got a plan to keep you socially distant we're not going to do you know the projection or something like that on the castle or 
hey, we're going to do harmonious um, because you can go all the way around World Showcase Lagoon. I think we're getting close to one of those announcements as well. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you mentioned that last week, and I, I just didn't – I don't know if Magic Kingdom launching fireworks is preliminary testing or just testing their modifications to the, the structures that they have been working on in the renovation over there. So I can tell you from my experience when the little mini parades happened, right? So like what I'm talking about is right now in Magic Kingdom, really in all the parks, they have little things where guests are going like Animal Kingdom, they the characters were on boats going through the different waterways. And in Epcot, there were, uh, we saw all of the princesses piled in this, um, st- piled in this stagecoach going all the way around World Showcase um, with plastic barriers between each row and one princess in each, in each row. Um, Magic Kingdom had a couple of different floats that they used, like the big grand princess float, they put that one out, filled it with about six, seven princesses, put a little before and after behind it. And uh, so they've got these like mini parades going on, these mini character experiences. And in my experience while I was there, even that it caused a decent amount of pile up, you know, a person or two or three deep to look at the parade as it went by Obviously, nothing near a three o'clock Magic Kingdom parade. Obviously, nothing near that. But, but still, um, social distancing, you know, my family, we tried to stay like way, way back, or I'd put my kids up on my shoulders um, so that they could see it because I wasn't really comfortable with with the social distancing that was going on because people were like, oh, this is exciting. Now, everybody's wearing masks. You're only standing next to each other for like under five minutes. So, yeah, CDC is going to tell you that that's a relatively low risk encounter and all that great stuff. But um, I just don't know about fireworks, how that would work. I just, it would just be a nightmare because it's in the sky. So there's absolutely no way to truly control like where the viewing is from. I can see your point about um, maybe getting Epcot up and going. Because with it all being in that central lagoon, you could argue that we are able to distance out the people. But at Magic Kingdom, I just, there are only so many good vantage points where you're not like glancing over a building or looking through a tree or whatever else. So, but when you take away the dessert parties and the special access events and and all of that you open up all those courtyards as well that are kind of fenced off i really think with a lower crowd you could maintain social distancing you could maintain that six feet between groups and you're going all the way down main street i mean at 35 percent capacity i still think you could do that i mean it takes a little bit of people actually having some self-awareness and understanding that, hey, you know, you don't have to be a dick and get the best spot available because there's going to be plenty of places where you can see them. And I think it's something that they can bring back relatively sooner than later. I I really think you're looking probably early 2021 for that stuff if they don't try and do something New Year's Eve. Well, here's hoping on it, but I still, you, you, brought up a couple of really key points there, self-awareness and um, not, and so self-awareness and selfishness are two words that you brought up there that unfortunately, like, I feel like you're, you're, we're, we're hoping for a lot here. I get your point for sure. Like you could use Tomorrowland Terrace seating and you can use all of those courtyards where the dessert parties use. So all of those, all of those, um, the hub green grass, they had a they had a shirt down there that says my favorite color is hub green, so it was uh, it was really I really enjoyed that shirt. So um, you're right, out in front of the castle has plenty of space. It's still just a, an issue or question of can people give themselves and each other physical space because there's only so much that Disney cast members can do and. If that guy comes up and tries to get that prime viewing spot from where that other family already is and they go, hey, give us our distance, 
and all of a sudden an altercation begins, you're just, you're just opening up a lot of possibility and, and issue. So yeah. I could maybe see like Disney boxing off a bunch of boxes and like you claim your box. Um, I could maybe see something like that. But again, as the night, you know, as the sun goes down and the courtyard darkens, unless they're going to make it all out of fluorescent tape. But I just, I, I just look at it thinking, holy cow, I would feel bad for the cast members responsible for that area and how many altercations are going to begin when that family gets too close. And boy, I just, I, it just seems like something that, and maybe you're right. Like maybe it's on Disney's radar, but I just don't know if it's something that, uh, that they would want to take on right now. Um, you know, we talked about kind of like the midway busyness. I, I realized the other day, well, that's also because all of the play areas and pre-shows and everything else like that are closed. You know, how, how often do you walk through the exit of Figment and that whole area is full of kids that have been in there or after test track or whatever. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So pushing people out of the buildings, getting rid of um, some of those experiences. So I know, I hope you're right. I What I did notice, so we actually saw Wishes one of the nights, um, and or Happily Ever After, and uh, we went and saw that, and they put it up on a display. So they had a big inflatable screen and a projector, and they played Happily Ever After just before they played the movie for the night. Um, so my family, we happened to be walking by, and we popped in, and we got to see the whole Happily Ever After show. So... Um, you know, it's not live fireworks. It's not the live show, but they are piping in the show every night at every resort. So, and that, that, I mean, that's good to hear. We, that was something that wasn't going on or we didn't know what was going on when we were there in July. So, um, the other big thing that's going on is the remodel, refurb, rebranding of Epcot. And they've announced quite a few things with that one being that the harmonious barges not only are going to provide the spectacular night show, but during the day they are going to have a water feature element to them. Um, so they're taking the fountains out of that main kind of hub area in the middle of the park right behind Spaceship Earth, and they're moving it to uh, World Showcase Lagoon. Um, the other thing they announced is that the festival area, which was this, supposed to be this grand three-story building, and it was going to provide projection for the uh, for Spaceship Earth and all this kind of stuff is now completely gone. Um, and that Spaceship Earth is going to be getting an LED light overlay, which will be cool because it's going to make it kind of sparkle and shine and they're going to be able to do all kinds of stuff with those LEDs. Um, but just uh, uh, really more cutting of cost at Epcot. You know, what are your thoughts on those, Peter? Well, I think, so cutting of cost is... Um is going to happen. We've kind of talked about that. I think it was last episode, maybe even we even talked about, um, you know, Disney's postings and their financials and, and all of that stuff. Um, you know, keeping the parks open, but keeping them with really what, what would be classified as like skeleton staff right now is kind of how the parks are open. Um, so it's, it's to be expected, but at the same time, um, it's the update we're going to keep moving forward with the, the sort of new, new look, but at the end of the day, it's, it'll be okay. And it might come back into the plans at some point, but right now it seems like we're going to, you know, this is the direction we're going to go. Like you said, that uh, festival headquarters was, was going to be really neat. Um, but they already have the like the building off to the side in between Canada and Great Britain. They already they already yeah. have a lot of really usable spaces. Um, you know, the old Canada Theater was used uh, this year. The old Canada Theater is up and running, but last year the old Canada Theater was used for housing part of the Food and Wine Festival. So there are already a ton of really great spaces in Epcot. And if anything, I'm glad that they're ripping down and reinventing because you talk about like the building where um, Club Cool was. Mm -hmm. that was. That was a huge building and it did nothing more than provide me an air conditioned walkway on really hot days to walk from the fountain over towards the land pavilion. You know, there was like nothing ever going on in there. So well, you I, had that you had that meet and greet with 
uh, Mickey, Minnie, and Pluto over there yeah. as well. You're talking the back side of that, right? Okay. So, yeah, yeah. So yeah, you had Club Cool on the front. You had the Starbucks over there. And then on the other side, under the passageway, you had the character meet and greets. But the rest of that building was just, I mean, it was just dead space. It was, yeah. like I said, some hallways with some benches. People would sit in there, charge their phones, um, and all of that stuff. And if, if anything comes from this, the fact that they're demolishing and reimagining the space that they have is, is a huge win for Epcot because you just know that it's going to come out looking amazing. Yeah, so, I mean, you know that you have – you know, the journey of water coming, you know that you have Guardians of the Galaxy coming, you have Ratatouille, um, Remy's Adventure coming, you've got Space 220 coming. So there is a lot coming to Epcot right now. Um, I think, you know, the loss of that festival space, yeah, it is what it is. Um, I think more people are, are concerned about the loss of the Mary Poppins addition to the UK pavilion than they were about the festival space. Yeah, that is, that is, I was really looking forward to seeing Cherry Tree Lane kind of come about because you, you know that once they built Cherry Tree Lane, there was going to be, it was going to be really neat because I'm sure Mary Poppins was going to be a focal point of it. I'm sure they would even maybe like find ways to incorporate some of the bank's family members. I, I am betting that there would have been either like, uh, a leery or a chimney sweep like show that happened yeah. on and around yeah. it you know like like a, a repelling show or something like that with chimney sweeps or the lamp lighters or um you know depending on mary poppins or mary poppins returns but it's it is sad to see that if anything i hope that that gets back in like i said the festivals have been going on at epcot for years and years and years with no issue so losing this designed festival space just means that the festivals are going to run the way they have. Um, losing new experiences hurts me a bit more. So losing Cherry Tree Lane, I hope that that gets put back in sooner rather than later because that that really, you know, UK, we talk about each of the pavilions and like the things to do there. You know, Canada has the O Canada show. You've got like the drums in Japan as well as some other stuff inside of the pagodas. You've got You've got, um, you know, China has the aerial acrobats. Norway's got the Vikings that walk around. You've got a bunch of stuff inside of the pyramid in the Mexico pavilion. UK doesn't really have that. Like, they got a couple of, right, they have a couple of red phone booths that everybody goes and touches. And then they have some shops. And they have, a, you know, the, the restaurant there is fantastic. But I'm also a big fan of shepherd's pie, fish and chips, bangers and mash. So, of course, I'd say that Rose and Crown is fantastic. I love popping into the pub and grabbing a drink on my way through. But there wasn't, like, we need to... They had that one, that, they had that one stage in the back of the pavilion where they had that British Invasion show for a while. Right. And that was about it. Yeah, and some bands would play back there. Yeah, yeah you had the garden back. But nobody knew about it, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Because it was so off the beaten path. At least Cherry Tree Lane, that's where it was going to go, is back in that garden area. And Cherry Tree Lane would have been a destination spot and lured people into UK because UK just doesn't have the thing that lures you into it in the way that many of the other pavilions do. Like um, Morocco is another one. You could go to Disney tons of times and never see Morocco because there's nothing that lures you in other yeah. than like the beautiful mosaic tiles. Yeah, and I guess the other thing when you start talking about it is – the introduction of IP into Epcot. And, you know, it kind of started, I guess, with Finding Nemo at the Seas Pavilion. Um, but you're seeing more and more Disney movies infiltrate Epcot, which once used to be just a prototype city of tomorrow. Now it's turning into an IP showcase for a lot of different things. So, you know, they're talking about the Cherry Tree Lane. You know, it's off the it's off the map right now, but does it come back in the future? You know, uh, there's been a lot of rumors about Coco in the Mexico Pavilion. I hope. Uh, you know, Frozen took over Norway, the Norway Pavilion. Um, does Remy's this in France? Yeah, does this take away from the allure of Epcot for maybe not the the Disney cartoon fan? 
That's a, a really lovely point. Um, I think so Maelstrom was where Frozen Ever After is now. They didn't really change the ride track all that much, but obviously they, you know, gave it a completely new facade and, and put Frozen over the top of all of it. And there were some diehard Epcot faithfuls that were furious that, because um, Maelstrom was, it, it was basically like a journey back through Scandinavian Viking culture. Yeah. And, and for it to just kind of be swept to the side to bring in, uh, to bring that in. Now, in the Mexico Pavilion, the ride in there is all, it's not really a celebration of, of the culture down there as much as it's Donald Duck running around everywhere acting like a clown. So I, I really, if you were to bring Coco into the Mexico Pavilion, I really think you could celebrate that culture far better than the ride currently does by allowing Coco to come in there. Um, but to your point, you're absolutely right. Well, what it will do on the flip side of that is it will draw families in where Epcot has been historically looked at as not the family-friendly park, bringing in things like Frozen, Guardians of the Galaxy, Remy, a potential switch over to Ratatouille, bringing Mary Poppins in, which is now generationally relevant again mm -hmm. with the making of the two new Mary Poppins. Um, so yes, absolutely. Walt's original vision was that Epcot would be a place where it, essentially Epcot, Walt's original vision of Epcot was that it would essentially be a world's fair 365 days a year where yeah, individuals yeah. could bring innovations, innovations could be made, people could explore innovations. Um, and it's never been that. It's, it, never, it never became that because Walt unfortunately passed away in its development and was never there to really fully see its inception. Um, so now Epcot is what it is. It's a celebration of, if you think what we've got, we've got the space area, which is going to soon be rebranded as the discovery area. Um, we have the land pavilion, which will be the earth area. And then we have the cultural area. Um, so Epcot is exactly what it is. It's celebrating the land. It's celebrating space achievements. It's celebrating our achievements in engineering. If you think about test track over to Guardians of the Galaxy. And then you have this cultural celebration where you can go and you can pick up and understand different pieces of different cultures from around the world. Um, so it's no longer the experimental prototype community of tomorrow, but really it never was because it never really became what Walt envisioned. But it doesn't take away from how amazing and awesome Epcot is. It's my number one favorite park is Epcot. Yeah, um, yeah. I love the World Showcase. I love the cultural immersion. Um, it it was great to go, but it really stunk that the people weren't there from the homeland um, in all of the different nations. You know, a couple of them did. Like China had people from China, but I talked to several of the cast members. I was like, are you from China or is like mom and dad or grandma and grandpa from China? And they're wearing like a, you know, Hong Kong name tag. And he goes, Oh yeah, Gra grandma's from China. They just put Hong Kong on my name tag. I was like, okay, yeah. So you've your family's been in America for generations, um, you know. And they did that same thing with like the naturalized French citizens. They're the ones running the France Pavilion, mm -hmm. and all of that stuff. But um, I don't know. We got off track there at some point during that talk about Epcot. But to your to your original question, I personally think that bringing in it's bringing Disney into Epcot because Epcot was sort of its standalone thing. It, there wasn't really a lot of like, how does this tie to Disney other than it's a Disney park? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. and it's where a lot of the exchange program people go when they come over to do that. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's about all um, that I've got for you. Do you have anything else you want to talk about on this episode? You're not going to talk about the train. Oh, yeah. How are that, you that, not going to talk about the announcement about the train? Yeah, I, I completely forgot. I'm glad you said something. So Brightway announced, Brightway, yeah, Brightway announced that they are going to be putting a high-speed rail station at Disney Springs. So in essence, 
the goal of this high speed rail system was to connect Miami to Tampa um, and connect basically Northern Florida to Southern Florida with high speed rail. Um, and here recently we knew that there was one a station going into Orlando International. They've now come to an agreement with Disney to put a station at Disney Springs, which is going to be amazing because that cuts that trip from 40 minutes to what do you think? 15, maybe? Uh, from the moment I start to board, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's going to substantially cut that time. Now, two questions that I would have is, is first off, is, is Disney going to use this as possibly a relief valve for the Magical Express? Um, and the other thing would be, is this something that as a normal traveler, you would use other than Magical Express coming into Orlando International. You know, what are your thoughts on those? So statement one, don't call Tampa Northern Florida because people from the Panhandle and all there are going to get you really bad. Because Pen Pensacola is just south Southern Alabama. <laughs> southern Alabama. Boy, we are uh, – ratings are dropping, Matt. <laughs> So, um, I would consider Tampa and Orlando Central Florida. Okay, okay. So, especially because when you come into Orlando, they say, welcome to Central Florida, and Tampa's south of Orlando, so it's got to be. Uh, okay. You know, right. Okay, so anyway, um, yeah, Orlando to Tampa, Tampa to Miami, this high-speed railway uh, sounds amazing. I don't think Disney will use it as part of Magical Express. I can't imagine that that is an effective way unless Disney is looking to, I don't know, shift workers or, or move labor in some way. Because, yeah, Magical Express, when the luggage service is going, you've got the front desk check-in, right? You've got the desk at the airport check-in. You've got the baggage handlers that take it to the resorts. You've got the resorts who normally will check your bags for you and get it to the airport. You've got this whole shuttle system of drivers bringing bags to and from the airports. You've got the bus drivers bringing people to and from the parks. You've got all of this stuff. Um, so unless Disney were looking to do that. And then I would say if Disney moves the railway, you know, moves Magical Express over to this railway, sure, ease of travel, but you're still going to have to take people so Disney Springs would have to really beef up its bus service schedule, have to start running at all hours of the day. Um, the other thing that would have to happen is that train, uh, you basically have to just have a Disney dedicated train that just zips back and forth mm -hmm. because there's no way that this company is going to want 50, 60% of its travel going just from Orlando to Disney Springs when really its goal is to connect Orlando to Miami in arguably an hour, maybe hour and a half trip um, versus what is it now, like four, something like that, if you're driving. So um, I just, it's really, really cool. It's really, really exciting. I view it more as what you said at the end. If I want to give my kids a cool travel experience, I might travel from Disney Springs to Orlando or Orlando to Disney Springs outside of the magical express you know maybe once the luggage service is back maybe i check my bags in indianapolis disney grabs it throws it in my hotel room and i just don't check in for my bus yeah and you just I, go you just jump on the rail system go straight to disney springs now the one thing yeah. that kind of hampers you know somebody like me and i know somebody like you is normally when as soon as we get to our resort we're going to a park and you can't do that from Disney Springs. They don't want you parking at Disney Springs and then going to a park. Right. So, you know, you would have to go from Disney Springs to a hotel or Uber or minivan when those come back. I mean, we're talking about logistically, it's another step to use the rail. And we're, we're still probably, what, two, three years out from even oh, thinking yeah. about something like that. But I mean, it, it's cool that the announcement's made. It's cool that you're going to have another way to travel from... Orlando International to a Disney property. Um, I just think, you know, I, I think there's going to be things that come along with this that we aren't thinking about yet that 
are going to make this really, really cool. Yeah, and a, a quick – so what this would be, though, because I don't think everybody is the same as us. I think we're exceptions. Um, you know, not everybody's willing to travel with their kids at 7 a.m. so that they're down there by 9 and in the parks by 11. A, a lot of people do like to fly midday and are going to fly at those 11, those noons, those 1 o'clock flight times, in which case it would be great to – have the Magical Express luggage service, grab my luggage, take it to my room, and I high-speed train to Disney Springs and spend my first seven hours in Disney, walking around Disney Springs, have a reservation there that night, and then take that bus back to the resort. My bags are already waiting in my room for me. Um, so maybe Disney does some type of an agreement where a Disney person can get a discounted rail ticket or, or something like that. Um, I just don't know if Disney will work on creating like, like I said, you basically have to have a train dedicated just jumping to and from if you're going to have any substantial amount of Disney clientele taking that railway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. I see what you're what you're saying there, and it makes sense. So, um, want to thank you for coming on the show again this week. Uh, we got Thanksgiving Thursday. Happy Thanksgiving to your family. You um, have a good weekend. We'll catch back up next Tuesday and uh, talk about whatever Disney tries to slide past us during the Thanksgiving holiday. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Matt. Uh, have a great day, and thank you all for watching, those of you watching. So, yeah, that was our conversation with Peter today. A lot of things to go over if you were watching the comments. Um, did make some corrections Park Hopper is starting on January 1st. At least that's what the flyer says. It is bright line and not bright way. So a few different things. But, you know, a lot going on still at Disney. Um, holiday season now, full swing between now and, you know, that week of Christmas. Usually a pretty good time to travel to Disney, you know, if you are looking for those last second trips. Um, I think that week of Christmas, it's going to start picking back up. And then you have your big mad rush from christmas to new year's and then it kind of dies down again so you know um we're in that kind of ebb and flow of disney travel um right now so want to thank everybody for watching tonight again you can catch us over on facebook which that's where we're at today um at dpi podcast on twitter at disney insights and on youtube the disney planning insights podcast thank you all for watching tonight and you all stay safe and have a good day bye now